I, I would like to uh, to add that it just came back to my mind because it's really part of our conversation of the evening. Um, I am very friend with uh, Hopi people. It's years and years that I visiting. I am visiting them every year when I can, except now. And uh, did you hear about Prophecy Rock? Do you know Prophecy Rock? No. So pro they told me for years that it did not exist anymore. It had been destroyed and all until one day they took me to that place. It's a very secret place. Uh, it's a huge rock, which is about, uh, I mean, maybe uh, it's difficult for me to judge in yards, but could be seven, eight yards, eight, I think, five. And so, and it is dated more than uh, 15,000 years old. And you have lots of petroglyphs around. It's a small hill with lots of big rocks and uh, Kachinas uh, pictures on, on them too. And Prophecy Rock is very special. If you can visualize it very easy and it's right for now. You have a path which is designed as a line on which you have a small being uh, with his corn and uh, the stick to put into the earth to seed the corn. And for, for a long, long while he's walking just softly like that. Then suddenly this line, which is just going up very slowly, is separated into two lines. And you have a sudden line coming very steeply up. <coughs> and they explained me that it was the line of uh, the white man with technology. Well, it's not about colors, I mean, but sudden te technological development, which is really amazing because it comes from nothing. And all, all of a sudden, it comes this way. And Meanwhile, you have the second line, which is going on very slowly with it, They mean it is the guy who walks on the path of the, cre of the creator's path and who is following the way the creators has given to, to human beings. And suddenly, which is frightening, the line which is up breaks. Suddenly, there is no something in the middle, it's just breaking. You see people falling and blocks falling down. And the line which is under simply marks a small hall, never breaks, it's just a little difficult, and then it's going on again. The line up doesn't exist anymore. So they say it's just for the now that it had been given to, to mankind. So we are supposed, if we follow the creator's way, we are supposed just to have a kind of difficult part. It's written being not only a line, but small dots, you know, a bit difficult, but just a small time. And then again, we go on on the path of the creator with our stick and cord. <laughs> and so to honor that, uh, this winter I have main, uh, made uh, in my garden, I've prepared the, the soil uh, in permaculture with a small um, greenhouse that is, I still couldn't build. And I have my seeds that I brought back from Hopi Land with all the kind of corns we can make a living with. Because symbolically for me, it means, okay, I do that. I walk on the steps that the creator shows us, showed us to walk. And this, uh, I love, I love this place, Prophecy Rock, when you go there, you know, something special occurred to me one time, um, because normally you are not allowed to go by yourself. Now they allow some people to go with some happy people, but my happy friends know me well. And one the first time that le they left me alone there, for two or three hours just to meditate and do what I wanted. So it's forbidden in Hopi Land to take pictures. They don't want that. But of course I had a camera with me because of my long trip, you know, all around. And it was such a temptation for me to say, oh, maybe I could just take a picture of the Prophecy Rock, you know, to keep it in mind. And I said, no, no, I don't want to take that. But really it was a bit difficult for me. Then I realized that over the top of this hill, rocky hill, 
they're in the very blue sky, perfectly blue sky. You know, it's North Arizona, not one cloud. Suddenly, there was a cloud shaped like a triangle, but it was like a triangle of uh, sky, blue sky in the middle, and you had the clouds in a perfect other triangle. Can you imagine that? And so I looked at that, I said, oh, <laughs> there's somebody looking at me. And so I stayed for a couple of, year, of hours there. And only when I was back to my car, uh, after a walk to go back there, the, suddenly the, the triangle disappeared. For me, it was absolutely not a normal cloud, you know. <laughs> so, and I, I said, okay, I've done it. <laughs> I didn't take any picture anyway. Well, that's fun. The only pictures you need to take are the pictures with your mind. Yes, it's what they said. <laughs> they told me that all the time. You don't need that. You will remember us. <laughs> yes. And they are that's sure. exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it's really interesting because a lot of contactees are drawn to the indigenous and shamanic cultures. And these mm -hmm. cultures and these teachings hold so much wisdom for humanity, which is a huge reason why I believe those cultures were so uh, quickly eradicated during colonialism. The shamanic knowledge, the cultures, the um, prophecies, and their connection to ETs is very significant in this phenomenon because it is very strongly tied in. And I can say that most of the people that I've like met who are contactees are also, not only are they possibly genetically linked to the ETs through maybe medical stuff, like abduction stuff, but also a lot of us come from uh, shamanic lines somewhere in our genetic history there are shamanic lines there are is there is some some kind of a link between those two and that might have been why we were selected uh to become a part of these medical hybrid type programs um but in yes. almost everyone there is shamanism strongly linked to this phenomenon which is very fascinating and extremely important for the future right now that's coming yeah it's true because i'm a I do, I do past life regressions i'm a hypnotherapist and i know um a few of my past lives i've been a shaman i've i've seen roots and i've my mom I, in one past life my mother i remember us keeping it very secret because nobody could know that we were helping people in this one lifetime and she would show me all these things that medicines that we'd make from tree root or we were herbs or all these different things and i i guess she was a shaman and she taught me and then another one i was a witch and then people would i was um I was hung in one one lifetime like so a lot of these different and it's gone down my family line too and even you crystal i see what when i was looking at you i saw you the shaman and you too right when i was looking at you so it's funny that you say that because a, yeah. a lot of women i see yeah. it's the, the shaman or or the witch trials or things like that yeah actually i was going to say that when you were talking about uh, shamans that uh in two of my People have told me in two of my past lives that uh, one was uh, I was in North America. And I was uh, I was a shaman in, in North America, and uh, and um, the other one was in China uh, as uh, as a like a healer that walked from village to village uh, with medicines and that sort of thing. So I had been taken to shamanism by powerful dreams because it's something that I would not even have thought about, but I was shown so instantly what to do, where, in which part. And uh, then I met, well, I am in France, you know, it's far from here. And then I met a guy who was a very well-known uh, doctor on the West Coast, Yurok tribe. And I had an apprenticeship with that guy. How could you imagine that? For me, it was absolutely uh, crazy. And he used to say that, Shamanism was bullshit because for most Amerindian, they don't like the word shamanism because lots of Westerners do anything with that. But he passed away and then I had these, those, those dreams taking me to shamanism, to foundation 
for shamanic studies and I enjoyed that so much. And so, yes, I think they want us to learn all that because it's such a way to use our consciousness to develop it. It's, it's really fantastic too. And yes, yes, it, it helps the contact to, well, yeah. And I met so many people of many tribes in, in US. I wonder why I was born in France, you know, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> because of my work, I had to travel around US to, to teach my workshops. And every time I was somewhere, I wanted to meet the local tribes, you know, and I could understand that they have exactly the same teachings, the same kind of ceremonies, and only some feathers were different, no more. And so that was very interesting. We had opportunities to, to, to discuss a lot about the, the earth change before it occurred. And uh, wow, that's really, last time, for instance, my your teacher taught me, uh, last time it occurred on earth, the big change. And uh, the Hopi people told me something quite close too. Uh, so the creator had warned everybody, there were seers and shamans telling them, you have to get prepared, keep your consciousness in a high level, and don't focus only on uh, the 3D dimension or so. But pe most people didn't want to hear that because, of course, they had something else to do. And then they were warning them that it was coming, that it was now, very soon, and coming now. And one day the creator said, to the seers and shamans now you have to go to the high mountains and take ropes with you. And you have, uh, when the moment comes, you have absolutely to put the ropes uh, around you and big trees. So uh, it's impossible that the big waves would take you because there were big waves too, as high as mountains. And so some of them did that. And they were so distressed to see the big waves coming and not taking them, but taking all the villages and so. And so that was what occurred the last time. And then the creator met them again and uh, put together all the people left on earth and gave them corn and food of different kinds and instructions and sent them north, uh, east, west, south and so telling them uh, to recreate the world. So they say that it's exactly something like that, which is coming now. And uh, people of the four corners tell that, say uh, that it's the, a place which should be preserved too for that reason, which means many tribes together in the four corners, Arizona, Utah, and, uh, well, the four states, and New Mexico and so. Well, <laughs> that's another point of view too. They're very reluctant to speak of that the Hopi people because uh, one of my best friends, she's an elder about my age and I insisted so much to ask her about UFOs because I know they have really good relationship with them. They are visited every week nearly, and but they don't tell you, you know, just when I used to take somebody in my car, hitchhiking and, uh, did you see anything? Yes, oh, you, you missed it last week. There was one which, which stayed for two, two, two days in the courtyard of such a guy, showed me the house, unlucky. But my best friend, I, it took at least two years to speak of that with her. And one day she told me, now Marie-France, look at me, you know, the creator told us if we were speaking to you about this, the world will fall apart. And she said, I don't want the world to fall apart. So that's exactly the word she had. So I guess it's a mis misunderstanding and it means most of all that the day people on earth will really know the disclosure, I mean, about UFO. It would be at the time when the world would be on point of falling apart or so. But that's my mental telling that. <laughs> Yeah, wow. and I think it's really right. interesting because um, like I went over in the presentation, some of us have already been initiated into shamanism 
in our lifetimes without realizing that we were already practicing shamanism. And I think that yes. um, there are signs that people miss. One is when you're about 13 or 14, you start getting dizzy spells and you hear voices. And I talked about that a little bit in the presentation. Um, contact with extraterrestrials is a part of this for sure, but also contact with the spirit world. Being hit by lightning is a huge calling to shamanism or having a significant electrical shock. Usually it's lightning. Um, being almost mauled or coming face to face with a wild animal, which is usually your spirit animal or your power animal, your guide. These are all shamanic initiations. And so many people who are contactees, but also who are healers and powerful medicine people who come from lines of shamanism are going through a lifetime of initiation and don't ever be right they never they're never recognized as becoming initiated and i i sort of have a joke that i was initiated by the ets <laughs> because because it was kind of like that you know these events like being initiated by the star people and so yeah but can i ask you um crystal do you find that se centuries and centuries and centuries of 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 um keeping quiet because maybe you were called a witch or maybe because you were a shaman or just having to keep quiet from all these different past lives and and shutting yourself down and not showing that you were a healer in all these lifetimes because you were being shut down time after time after time after time for all these you know lifetime after lifetime now it's like on a sub on a unconscious level you you're scared to be heard and it's like it's almost like oh i don't want to say this i don't want to be prosecuted for this i don't want to be hung for this i don't want to be tortured for this i don't want to be it's almost like i like it's a fear it's like i don't want this to happen to me again what's going to happen if i do speak out do you know what i mean i do know what you mean but the one thing that um some of us uh need to know is there's people in this network who have been here many lifetimes and so you may have been here for many, many lifetimes. I know Marie France, you've been here for many lifetimes. And so you might be able to speak better to that because I know for sure that this is my first full lifetime as a human and that I came here as a pure soul to help with the ascension. So I actually don't know that I was ever a, sh a human shaman, although I believe I was uh, a healing soul. I don't think that this is, I don't think I've ever had any other lifetimes here. Wow. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And as for me, I have the, the clear feeling that I'm living too in another planet. And we were speaking of that with crystal. I couldn't sleep the night after because I would never have imagined meeting somebody who knows my planet, you know, and she knows somebody who knows it too. It's something absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, so Shakespeare used to say, what, there is more mysteries in the skies and, uh, that, yeah, than you can imagine or so. <laughs> it's exactly that. So it's huger. I think yeah. Shakespeare's line was, is more than in heaven and earth than I've dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Again, uh, the, these, when uh, we're shown these things on the screens, when we're on the ships, that was true. I think that these are warnings. It, it, it doesn't mean that this is exactly what's going to happen. But Absolutely, it, yeah. And, and, and we should take them very seriously, I think. Uh, oh, yes, I think I think we should do. This is a, it is a warning, and it is based on uh, timelines, which I think can be moved and, uh, and modified. So we do have choices. Uh, as Jeff was saying as well, that, that uh, we, humanity is given an option or a choice to sort it out. And if we can't sort it out, then they will step in and do what they're going to do anyway. Uh, it's just we, we have the choice of being part of that or not. I think you're right, Ian. I think that they do. They will step. They, they sort of said the same thing. You have a choice. Either you guys you guys figure it out we're giving you all the messages or if the worst case scenario if we have to step in at the very last seconds and i'm talking like very last seconds then they will and they will they will make sure that they preserve what life they can here 
Yeah, I, I, I have to check out soon, but I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for, um, for tonight, and uh, especially that very powerful uh, presentation, uh, Crystal. You, you know, that, that was a really polished um, presentation, and I was um, really proud to be part of that as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. We well, always appreciate your input, uh, Ian. You're unique and invaluable to the Bank Review of Formida. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, I do my best anyway, and it's it, uh, 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 it's good as well. To, um, you know, to bring some more people in, and uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it as well, Kalinda and uh, and Jane. Nice to meet you, Kalinda. Teachers are yeah, nice to meet you. I'm sorry, Kalinda, your mic was off. There's some background yeah. noise, and I turned people's mics off. I don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. I need to go too, but thank you so much for bringing me into the group, Ian, and thank you so much for letting me in, um, everybody, to your group, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, join us next I week. I loved it. Thank yeah, you. We're on every right. week, so come and join us, Glenda. Yeah, okay. you can be a guest yeah, speaker sometime. Everyone, check out the Telegram, the yeah. Vancouver yeah. UFO on Telegram. Yeah, and thank you. Hosting and we can start communicating with each other. Yeah, and Crystal, I love the presentation. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Glenda, we can book you. I'm Glenda, we can book you for a talk sometime if you want. We you do sure. your own story. Yeah. yeah, I'll email you your your link on the meetup. I'll email you. Sure, okay. we can do that. I just have to do it all out. I have to think think about everything. Like yeah, people did there. <laughs> There's quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but thank you. Okay. okay, bye everybody. Bye, bye, bye Kalinda. And uh, yeah, I have to go as well. Are you okay, Jane? Should, shall I leave you in the in the good company of these these good people? <laughs> Trust us, honest. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Jane. Thank yeah, you. Nice, uh, nice to be with you all. I think I'm going to dip out at the moment now because it's gone midnight. It's uh, <laughs> getting a bit late. And it was been great. Thank you so much for having me on. A long goodbyes. No, no, you should go Bye. first. Bye-bye. <laughs> I should Thank mention you, Jeff, uh, Jeff's video is out. We have five and a half hours of Jeff's presentation from January 17th, and it's in seven parts. It's on the Vancouver UFO Meetup. I just loaded it yesterday. And Jeff did all the editing himself. And when we had the uh, Zoom bomb, we had to get together for two hours and refilm that. So he put a lot of work into it. So take a look at that. And then Chris, I had another question for you. Um, we just talked briefly about the Federation of Planets. It's another big interest of mine. I first learned this from, uh, from Jeff and you and Jeff both feel there's this Federation of Planets. It seems to be very important if it, if, there, if it doesn't exist, it's a totally different reality. If it does exist, which I think it does, then that's basically the whole future of humanity. So can you comment a bit more on what you feel about the Federation of Planets? Yeah, so when I met the ETs, they were the greys. And so they, they, um, they spoke about themselves first and what, where they were from, what they look like, what, and then they gave me a history lesson on, you know, humanity, what's going on with the, in, the infestation of the dark ETs, and then they talked about the future. They talked about when they started to go into the future, they showed me a couple of things that were really um, encouraging and fascinating. And it looked just beyond our wildest imagination. It was so beautiful. The future was incredible. It was these cities that floated on the ocean, on, on the ocean, and it was totally like, you know, green. There was no fossil fuels, no nuclear power, nothing that was damaging to the unit, uh, to the uh, planet. And uh, they said, they showed me a classroom full of children and the children were learning about all of the beings who were part of the universe, but they said, you will become part of the um, intergalactic community. That's verbatim what they said, intergalactic community. So. A lot of people have translated that over to Federation, but when I quote them directly, it's intergalactic community. And so it was an understanding that they all work together as a community and that they were aware of us as per like our shamans traveling, looking for help when we had our infestation. Um, that's where it, sort of where it started. It looked like maybe we had our shaman leaving the planet asking for other beings to come help us. They were already formed in a, in a um, community or a federation because of their connection through consciousness. And it was my understanding that um, consciousness is one of the 
main ways of interspace and interdimensional travel. And so they were not able to travel, not able to become part of the community until they were able to transcend their physical bodies and operate in consciousness. And that is an understanding amongst all of the co uh, intergalactic community that the ascension into the high levels of consciousness is essential in order to become part of that community. And so we essentially move up into a higher um, evolution a higher evolutionary class um, and we are able to become part now as it stands currently right now because of our uh, attachment to our physical bodies and our very slow progression through consciousness not all of us but as a whole like say as a whole species or as a whole you know we're not quite there yet but we will be and then we will become part of that community in and so they were different beings and I've met a few of them. And so I can tell you, Mary Franz, I've met some of her people. They were the tall Nordics. And uh, they also come from Orion as well, Orion's belt. Um, there was some other beings. I've met like a bunch of them, but not, not even close to all of them. But I met some that were actually like little green men so i don't know i guess maybe that's where the little green man thing came from because i did meet beings that were little green beings and so i met them i'm not sure where they're from um there were light beings that were so high level that they appeared to be angelic and they emanated beautiful pure light and a rainbow sort of uh pattern so they had this rainbow field around them which i mean i could get into that another time because that actually is something that's important this rainbow field but there was um, a lot of different beings. There was, um, of course, you've got the greys and then the different variations of greys because I have met more than one type of grey. I've met the little greys that I would consider to have like the small faces and the big black eyes that wrap up and around and they're about three and a half feet tall. But then I've also met the other ones who have an elongated jaw. And so they are like the master um, teachers and healers and they are also always robed and some of the beings across the uh, federation also are almost always robed uh, robe is a um a symbol of something within their their religious or spiritual practices so many of them are often robed and the attire and what they wear actually does have some relevance when it comes to their own spiritual practice and cultures as a species each of them so I, th I thought that was interesting, like Marie France and I were discussing uh, that they, some of the beings that she has been in touch with have ceremonial clothing as well. And that those ceremonial clothing are only worn during their spiritual ceremonies and religious practices, which goes along with the information I've seen as well. So I think that's very interesting. And some of them are very human-like. Some of them look nothing like human and are almost difficult to see um, when we do, like when I do my uh, meditations and I have uh, in the past gone forward to try to make contact with other beings, some of them actually have a hard time manifesting into the 3D dimension or even into the, I guess if you're meditating, you might go up maybe another level or two, but you don't go, I don't usually go too high up uh, unless I'm going way way up in a deep meditation and it's easier for them to present themselves but if i'm just sort of in a basic meditation it's hard to actually see some of the beings they i've actually watched them try to manifest and come through as sort of a color or an orb but not able to actually show me what they really look like in their own physical bodies and so that was a couple times that it happened and sometimes they appeared as orbs or as a shape trying to manifest i didn't actually see their full shape so you know, one wow of, one of i the, like that so all, all these beings are part of the federation of planets you saying yes all of them are yeah they work together so when i first started to become very i had my et epiphany and that was just recently you know i had, had made contact but then i just put it aside for many years of my life and let it go because nobody believed me and it just didn't seem like it was the right time to start speaking about that publicly or so when I started to feel the call to action and I started to meditate 
and try to make connections again, I found that um, some of the beings were easier to see than others. They all work together. It's like they were all aware of people who were uh, attempting contact. So they were eager to talk to us and they were almost like waiting to talk to each of us. Like it was like, okay, my turn now. And so they were coming forward, politely introducing themselves. It was diplomatic communication. So they didn't just show up and like, you know, they weren't just like right in your face or inappropriate. They were very polite, very, very, very um, diplomatic. So they would appear, introduce themselves, try to show what they look like. They would explain briefly where they were from, and then they would let the next being come forward. And as I said, some of them had a hard time manifesting. And so um, I, I wasn't able to see all of the ones that I did meet quite a few. I probably met about 10 different um being uh, species, different species in total during my meditations. And uh, one of them was able to heal a, a very serious injury. And I asked for help and I had a very, very serious nerve disorder in my neck healed instantly, which was considered, it was considered not, not curable. They were, they, the doctors were having a very difficult time and were had referred me to a, a chronic pain clinic so I could have injections into my spine to stop the nerve disorder because it was excruciating pain and it was at the point where I couldn't sleep and they they healed me of that it's been months of the pain is completely gone now since that very moment that I met them and that was the little green ones that I met little green little green men little green men so they they actually did do you know healing and help me physically with with that and which was huge huge for me. I changed my life because I was out of chronic pain. So that was really great. Uh, we should book another talk with you more details. I'm interested more in the uh, the process on uh, how we get from point A to point B with the Federation of Planets, how we'll end up in this more, you know, paradise world. Like uh, Jeff said, the Elder Gray told him they're moving slowly and intuitively. So my understanding is um, for a century, we've had the um, the the uh, alien abductions with the greys and people like yourself are hybrids you're getting dna so it's gradually entering our society so people don't see there's hybrids living among us uh, could this take centuries i don't know but is, is this the process from point a to point b like if this happened say forty five thousand years ago when we had um, the dll gene we got larger brains you know it seems that their tie lines they have lots of time they're no hurry right they think in terms of thousands of years how do you see the, the process of how the Federation Planets will finally become public? Like, I guess, will it be like an event or uh, what's, what's the process? Well, that was, that was shown by the waves being the process. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we will reveal ourselves when humanity is on its knees. For, that's a quote. And then they said, you will become part of the intergalactic community. So we don't necessarily have to like uh, ask to be included in it or uh, have to ask to be part of it. We uh, become part of it uh, when the ETs step in and uh, work to rebuild the world into a different uh, new world. Yes, yeah, so that seems to answer the question of uh... Um, maybe we don't need to, you know, head out to a farm out in the country and get together with our money and our guns and our plants. Like, maybe we can just, just let it happen. The ETs will save some of us. And if we die, that's no big deal either. With rebirth, we can take rebirth in this new world anyways, or we can be saved or not. No big deal. Uh, so maybe we could just try to stay positive, focus on the ascension ourselves personally, and just stay where we are and work it out. What, what do you think? I'm too lazy to leave the city, you know, and, and learn how to farm. I'm just a city boy. I got no skills. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know, Brian. I think we have to get through a couple years where we are going to have to come together. Like if you live in an apartment, what are you going to drink for water if the um, society is collapsing and the there's no more sewage or no more water maintenance or electricity, the grids are going down or you can't live in a city like that because the city is dependent on all of these systems. And so you guys will have no choice. You'll have to leave the city. And so if you are surviving through those events, then you'll become desperate. So I think that if you feel called to 
the Seek Out Other community and start working together, which a lot of us, I mean, a lot of us are getting called to do that. I think that that, that doesn't require, it's, it's going to be a lot easier than having to desperately seek out a way to survive through earth changes. Um, if that is, because it does look like that could be a very real possibility. And even world economists are saying that when we reach the peak of inflation, and when it costs a million dollars to buy a loaf of bread, that people are going to get desperate, and nobody's going to be working, and things are going to collapse in domino effect throughout societies. And so, yeah, it's, it's very realistic, even if we didn't know anything about ETs, and if we were just looking at the current events with COVID and how this is playing out, it could very well be possible. Wow. Just, I should see if anybody else likes to comment. I don't want to hog all of uh, Crystal's time. We got Rolf here. Rolf hasn't spoken the last, we've been at this for five and a half hours now. Way to go, Crystal. Should we go for a record? <laughs> hey, Rolf, how you doing? Oh, I'm still alive. 86 years old, our oldest known abductee. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a farmer. I would go near the coast. I like fishing. But then you can eat kelp, you don't have to farm. And uh, there was a group in Ontario that tried it a few years ago. I don't know if you recall it. They even went with an ox cart. I mean, real like, you know, the early pioneers. Well, of course, the first thing was the ox cart broke down and they didn't really know how to fix it properly. And eventually they got to the place which either the government gave them or, or somebody owed, whatever. But uh, they got tired of it very soon and uh, went back to Toronto. Yeah. But of course, in, in the case that, that we are proposing, you cannot go back to the city because nothing will be functioning there. But there is not enough farmland or possibilities for too many people. I heard uh, Mimi mentioning 144,000. I don't know where she got that number from, but that's exactly the same number that the Jehovah Witnesses are saying. Yeah. But, but now you have more members than that, so they, they actually up that number a little. So I was curious, I don't know if Mimi's still there. I think the Calvinists have that number too. Maybe we should convert to the Amish faith, right? They live off the land, right? No electricity, they're used to that. We move into an Amish community. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And a lot of them are Swiss uh, origin. So I can probably move there. Well, maybe I die before then. Let's hope so, for, for me at least. I, no. First of all, I, I'm not afraid, but... Uh, I definitely don't want to give in to, uh, you know, any, any government procedures. You know, my, my Rue family comes from Germany in the 1860s. Many of them came to Pennsylvania, United States, and they're living there on farms and they're Amish, so maybe I'll just hook up with them. Right. right. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'll just stay in the big city and go down with the ship. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, maybe your gas pumps won't work. So you can't even drive down. But you can start walking, but maybe on the way you starve to death or freeze to death or whatever. It all depends, right? But uh, definitely I, I, I see the calamity co coming too. Not, not through any spiritual, uh, just, you know, my own observation, my own logic tells me that. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've seen it coming and, and if really, if one listens to what uh, politics are up to now, it is clearly evil. There is no doubt about it, you know? I mean, how can you even say to some people, well, because you're such and such or you voted such and such, or this is your religion, you have no right to live in my city. 
for instance, I mean, back in Switzerland in the old days, there were such rules, you know? If you weren't part of their community, uh, well, I mean, in those days, they had walls around their cities, right? They didn't want to let any strangers come in or, or any, any, any uh, you know, other, other people that wanted to take over your, your city or your town or whatever. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, but uh, I don't have, I mean, other than, you know, the, the visitation and the implants, I, I don't recall getting any messages from anybody. Uh, dreams, well, I had a very strange dream, which I've never forgotten, but uh, it wasn't uh, prophetic or anything. It just had to do with, with, with the afterworld in, in other words. Yeah, it, it was a really strange thing. But, you know, a dream, dream is a dream, but uh, for some people, some dreams are, are very real. So, it's some, some dreams are just plain fantasy, don't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We will see what what comes down as, as long as we keep vigilant and not being taken in by uh, you know political talk uh, unfortunately i still have too many friends most of them are dead that are taken in uh, by the politicians and they believe whatever anybody says, you know, they, they don't see, they cannot, I mean, it's, it's just, to me, it's so blatantly open and crystal clear what is going on. But these few people that I know right here in Vancouver, uh, they haven't got the faintest clue and they, they, they think that I'm crazy, you know, by pointing out certain things. I said, well, can't you see that? No, no, they just don't see it. I, I mean, think it, we all share your experience. I think all of us know people like that and family members like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. Anyway, I think I have to go. My wife is uh, telling me that I should be hungry by now. Okay, glad you chimed in there, Ralph. <laughs> See, we're I, getting a story bit by bit. I've, I've always invited you to give your whole life story. So we're getting bit by bit. These videos. <laughs> oh, you want my whole life story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, you know, we were we were talking about numbers, and uh, just recently, just a few days ago, it occurred to me. I said, "Oh, I have really a strange number," and that is February third. That happened to me twice which totally changed my life. And the first one was when I left Canada on February 3rd, 63, to move to California. And, and the second was when I met my second wife accidentally and we got married in the Caribbean on February 3rd, 1973, 10 years later. Woo! It's, oh, I mean, my guardian angel or whoever worked really hard. Later, I found out, first, I wanted to do a, a trip, a Alaska trip, which was sold out. Then I wanted to go to the Caribbean's uh, a, a Christmas cruise, which was sold out. So I thought, oh, well, I'd take the New Year's cruise when I got there. Well, after I met my wife there on the cruise, she told me the same thing. 
she did exactly the same thing. Wanted to do a, you know, an Alaska cruise which was sold out. She wanted to take the Christmas cruise which was sold out. And, and I was happily divorced. Finally, I had girlfriends in San Francisco. I didn't want to get, I, I, marriage wasn't on my mind, you know? And then we got married within three days. I mean, it's crazy, crazy. Within three days, that's love. Well, it's 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 really more than that. It's uh, could be past life karma, maybe. Well, it must be something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, I'm still married to her now. I was gonna commit suicide at one time, and I I was gonna slit my throat, and I had the knife here, and I was ready, and something held my my hand back. I mean, physically, I, I couldn't move it anymore, you know? Strange. And then the strange thing is, after that, I didn't want to kill myself anymore, you know? The idea, which I've forgotten what the idea was, I think it, it was a family thing. They somehow, I, I somehow felt I just didn't fit in or they didn't understand me or something like that. So, yeah. How old were you at that time? Uh, maybe 18, something like that. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's something to share, you know? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, they, they meant to keep you alive. Like, you probably had implants prior to that as, as a little kid. So they, they needed you. They wanted you to be alive. So it's amazing that someone stops, something stops you. Yeah. What a story. Holy smokes. Right, yeah. But I don't know what for, but uh, maybe someday we'll find out. You know? Yeah. It's uh, maybe you're only here to meet somebody else and uh, help them out in some way. One doesn't know. One doesn't know. That, that, that's the funny thing, right? We all have our destiny, but we don't know what it is. Yeah, we don't know how we affect others or your children. You know, you, you yep. have a positive effect on others, but it's impossible to know your effect on others, especially with videos going all over the world. You have no idea. You just you'll never be able to know. Yeah, well, and of course, that is dangerous, right? Because you know who invented electricity? Uh, who? Ben Franklin? Did he invent? <laughs> Lucifer. Oh, Lucifer invented electricity. <laughs> Yes, loose, right in Spanish, loose is like, well, probably in, in, in Latin, right? I don't know Latin, but I know a little bit Spanish. Yeah. Yes, interesting life we all have. And uh, especially now that we are meeting each other and uh, yeah, it's interesting. So we are using the devil's invention but uh, for good purpose so i want to ask as crystal like crystal you're talking about uh if the um, chinese invade can the united states and if these uh soldiers dress in black invade so suppose we're um, in a farm somewhere hold up in our, in our barn or farmhouse with five guns or ten guns and they've got this high-tech army with helicopters with phosphorus isn't it really like Checkmate. Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna um, fight them. We're just going to go where we're supposed to be, and we're gonna follow the signs that are. We're being kept alive. I mean, maybe these accidents, these freak accidents, were attempts on our lives because we had a purpose. Because maybe we were connected through the hybrid uh, programs, or maybe we had those shamanic bloodlines, or maybe it was both. Or maybe, you know, but there's reasons why we're not, we would already be dead if we were meant to die. So if we were in an event like that, many of us would probably be very um, synchronistically lined up to be in the right place at the right time. We would be given the messages and we will, you know, there's also collection points that people have been, I've been shown two collection points in the area that I'll be in. And so um, I've been shown people being led to them by other people. So others are getting messages. Are um, you want to share the two collection points? Is this on uh, your area or do you don't want to discuss where you are? 
Yeah, well, there was a collection. Well, there was one collection point on the top of the Andes in the the tallest peak in the Andes. I know that the indigenous people already know of this and were shown it and told where to go. Um, there were collection points in Nelson, in Nelson, BC. There was two that I saw. And um, one of them was up by Pulpit Rock and the other one was on the golf, the golf course area. So there were two collection points and um, I guess they were, they had them across the water from each other for people who lived on the bridge. Maybe the bridge did collapse or something. I don't know. But anyway, there were two specific there. And then uh, those are the ones that I saw, but I also saw that it was like, it was like this worldwide thing where people who were given the messages, like they were leading people to those collection points. So uh, Rolf, you might be one of those people who ends up getting the message and takes everybody there. It looks like other shaman and prophets and people and contactees have had similar visions of certain people being designated to guide others to those spots. And so that's sort of like the evacuation. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think it's going to happen and I hope it doesn't. And I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not going to like panic, but I do think it, I think it, it's a strong possibility that it, it will happen. Um, and in that case, that might be why we're here just to do that act, just to guide others to be uh, able to survive into the new world. Um, maybe we'll make it to the new world as well. We're to, we're here to be of service and we're here to, I think, to guide others into a new future, you know, and I, I think we can be of service by being able to receive the messages, even if we don't think we can, we will, we will receive them, especially people who are already contacted. There's no way that you were contacted, that you've been chipped or had any type of contact with ETs without them having ways of monitoring you and um, maybe subconsciously communicating messages to you when needed or as needed. And does that mean it's not necessary to um, give up your life in the city, get a bunch of friends together, buy land, try to grow crops on a few acres and survive on a farm of the country? Maybe that's not necessary then. I mean, I feel like I have to do start doing something. Like, I feel like I'm drawn to, to find community now. That's like the first step is community. So uh there's a lot of people that are doing that it's at the point where it's actually hard to it's actually hard to find affordable pieces large parcels of land right now because many people are forming land cooperatives and starting to form community and people are everybody is talking about uh forming uh, making gardens even my uh even my family members are, are all of a sudden they're making gardens and they're they're really inspired to do that do you think that maybe we already are getting those messages i i think that even people who have nothing to do with ets are already picking up on that yeah a lot of people know about the new world order feel like agenda 2030 like the biggest single uh owner of farmland in America is Bill Gates. So the, the New World Order is trying to corner stuff. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are thinking that people have nothing to do with UFOs and aliens. Yeah, yeah so I, I do have to go pretty soon here. I have to take my dogs out. They've been so patient. <laughs> I mean, you could take them out and come back, but we've only been going for five or six hours, but whatever you want. Do you want to sign off or do you want to come back? I think six hours is a, is a good stint. How does everybody in the group here feel? Do we feel like we've covered some ground? Yes. <laughs> you guys ready to go to sleep in Europe? No. In France? Are you still awake? <laughs> is Mimi still with us? Where's my co-host? Marie, Marie France is still with us. Yeah. yeah, it's not the same kid carrying on without you, Chris. So maybe when you go, we should just wrap up for the, for the afternoon. Yeah. Hey, Brian, I was oh, just going yeah. to bring up a, a book series that um, others might know of or may not. It's called uh, the Foxfire series. And that's 12 volumes. And that's, uh, that was written by actually um, a teacher and his students uh, in the Appalachian part of the US. And what it does is it gets into the, the history and then it uh, gets into the real basics of how to live off the land. In other words, it shows you how to make furniture and how to, uh, if you do 
shoot animals, how to prepare them to eat, and then how to grow and how to fix even wagon wheels and make all sorts of different types of tools as best one can. And um, it, it has a real uh, uniqueness to it. And um, as a series, and there's something that you can get some of that uh, through PDF online for free, or you could buy the series, which is about $200 for 12 of the books. And uh, they get into how to cook uh, with Dutch ovens. And uh, in other words, if you're talking about uh, trying to start a community, it, it, it actually be a real good, um, uh, what would you, uh, primer for, for uh, sort of the lifestyle of, of uh, getting off the grid. So anyone out there that, you know, if you have an interest, uh, it's called the Foxfire series. But it's been a great show, uh, Crystal. Thanks for being with us six hours. And your your uh, website, you can say for the audience again, and they can email you directly, right? We can put your email below the video in the description. Yeah, so my, my email is, um, or sorry, I, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you the website. Uh, so the website is www.thelightgridnetwork.com. And so that is a website. It is for contactees to communicate with other contactees. Um, but we're not exclusive to just contactees. Um, but we are trying, or what, I, what I'm hoping to do is unite people who are holding these messages so that we can compare the messages and we can make sure that we are covering um, as much ground as we can because it seems like everybody is a little piece of a big puzzle and we're putting, we're putting it together um, and now it's time to come together in community and support each other uh, worldwide, worldwide, but also, you know, in our own areas too, we're, we're coming together. And uh, so it's creating a community, you know, a spiritual community or a compassionate community around each other. So we don't have to feel so alone. We can compare our, our experiences and we know that nobody thinks we're crazy because they've gone through these things as well. And and also, um, you know, just bringing the information forward as we're getting it, because many of us are still getting new dreams and new visions and new specific information that we are to bring forward. And so that is something that we can collaborate together and make sure that we get these messages forward to the world, not just with each other, but to the entire world, just like we're, we're doing with these groups. Yeah, well, that'd be a good note to end on. We really want to thank you for coming today, Crystal. You're a great addition to the Vancouver UFO meetup and more videos to come. We want you to come, come back on again sometime whenever you can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, see you, folks. I guess we wrap up. Okay. All Thanks right. Thanks for coming, everybody. We had 16 today.